Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Franklin Hu, and uh, this is the John Chappell Natural Philosophy 2019 Conference. And uh, so I'm doing things old style. I don't have any PowerPoint, and I'll be using the whiteboard here. And instead of lecturing at you guys, I want this to be more of an interactive session here. Because uh, normally I host the Saturday Science Chat, and uh, that's what we do. Sometimes we have topics, but other times we just, uh, we have topic with a specific speaker who has something in mind. But a lot of the other times it will just, we'll just pick a topic and uh, start talking about it. Talk about this uh, a lot, and uh, that will be the electrostatic field. So I, I would say the reason why we talk about it a lot is because uh, really mainstream itself doesn't have really strong ideas on how this stuff works. So I would say that is ripe ground for the um, thinkers in this room, and yeah, the critical thinkers in this room, because if we do come up with an answer, the mainstream at least won't tell us that no, that's not right because this is how it really works. So at least we're on, on ground where at least the mainstream itself doesn't have any really good ideas. So I was gonna kind of run this as kind of a brainstorming session and kind of wrap together all the things we've heard during this conference. So when David started out the conference, he's, he, I think he came up with a very good idea, which is that if we're going to come up with some kind of model to explain, for example, the electrostatic field, that uh, we should publish the list of things that we would like that model to be able to answer. Right, David? Right. Right, okay. Thank you for giving me credit. Yes, credit whenever credit is due. <laughs> Although I tend to steal any idea that makes sense, so. <laughs> Every once in a while, I come up with my own ideas, but a lot of it is just, that sounds like a good idea. I think I'll use that, right? So I think that's where we'll start. So let's first of all talk about the subject here and, and what we mean by it. So the electrostatic field. So what I think we need to make sure we're talking about is that if we have, we have something that's called an electron, right? So we have something called an electron. We'll call that like E minus, okay? So we have, we, we in science recognize that there's this particle, right? And uh, when we talk about the electrostatic field is that there, there's something that's coming out of this, this uh, electron here that, that every point in space, you can put like an electrostatic meter, you know? So let's say we have our little meter here and it's got a little pointer here, and you know it will swing to various uh, points. And if you put it really close, it's really high. And if you're really far away, then it gets low. So what we're talking about in the electrostatic field is that there is something that is emanating out of this electric, this uh, electron, that we can measure with a meter. So experimentally. Uh, that's what we're talking about, is that there's something out here that can be measured by a meter, and uh, the, the other thing is uh, we also have uh, an opposite, what we call opposite charge. So if this is like a proton, the proton does a similar thing. It also emits a charge, but our meter does the remarkable thing of swinging in the opposite direction than this one. So that's kind of the experimental uh, result that we get. And the even odder thing to each other, then this, this particle wants to run together to that particle, just spontaneously. You don't have to tell them to do anything. You put them close enough and they want to come together. Uh, now the, the other thing is, is that if this thing is actually an electron, 
Then, instead of them wanting to go together, they want to instead run apart, okay? And, and they do so with, with acceleration, right? So, that is the basic thing that we want to be talking about here. Okay, so I want to come up with a list of things that we think, so if I come up with some model, what are the things that you want it to explain? So Ray, give me, what do you think is the number one thing any model of the electrostatic field is going to have to explain? I have a question. Are, are we talking about electrostatic field? I'm a little confused. Now, are we moving this to a list of what any model should do and has to? No, do just it? just specifically the electrostatic field. So oh. just the static reaction of a positron to an electron. We're just going to try and narrow that down. So if you have a model, now your model may explain a lot more other things, but since we're talking about just the electrostatic field. What do we want it to? Hans, do you have a suggestion? I'd like to know how uh, far uh, the microphone splits or the uh, hands. I'd like to know, and I'll repeat it again. Need a mic. I need a mic. Yeah. Here. Okay, he's gone. I just okay. it off. I'd like to know how far that electrostatic meter that you described. Oh. Is is excited in every single point of the, of that field that you described. So, are you talking about the speed of the electrostatic field? No, you you earlier said that you can put uh, an electrostatic meter in every point of that field. Uh -huh. I'd like to know how far that electrostatic meter or what number that electrostatic meter shows. So you because, want to know, you're all, because you're also said, number. you also said if you put that electrostatic meter close to the electron, it shows a large value. If you put it further away, it shows a lower value. So I'd like to know what is the value for each position within that electrostatic field. So what is the value? Like for the, what is the value of the electrostatic field at any point? Yes. Okay, now I'm getting some chatter from my people on views here, so I'm going to have to uh, mute you guys or do something here. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, that's one. So. Probably we might have to take a look at like what, what an electrostatic meter does and what its units are. And you should be able to explain why why it does its thing, right? You might have to investigate. I don't know how those things work. Okay, number two. Bob, do you have a suggestion? Yeah, this is more of a broader question, uh, application of the electrostatic field, and that's cloud to cloud lightning. There is an electrostatic field between clouds that causes cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning. So what would you like? This is like Jeopardy. You have to form it in the, in the form of a question. <laughs> your model must describe cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning. How does your model describe cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning? We, we, we do it, so obviously someone's doing it. What causes specifically cloud-to-cloud? Mm, yes. I don't think that's the answer. Is that you want to know what causes it? It's not what the answer. cloud to yeah, cloud no, lightning, yeah. or, or or describe it. Well, you, there's still a cause behind it. Our cause, we have a cause behind it. Yeah, but I'm, I, I'm, I guess I'm I'm a little well, you, if you want to rephrase about it, cause. I, I, rephrase it any way you want. Okay, we got something there. I think that's good enough. What caused 
Oh, it is in the what caused cloud to cloud to lightning? Oh, causes. All right, here we go. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, so Ray, what do you think should be on our list of things that this needs to explain? Now, the most obvious things still aren't on this list here. Okay. Attraction, repulsion, acceleration between charges. Okay, that's I think the most obvious thing. What? Causes acceleration. One, two. What's the most popular one? That's right. Acceleration. Attraction. Repulsion. I don't think I spelled repulsion correctly. R E P U L? Well, in any case, I don't, I, I don't have, like, you know, my spell checker here on the screen here, so you're just gonna have to live with it. I, I, I've long lost, lost the ability to spell, so. Okay. Uh, uh, Alusa, what, what, what do you think should be on this list? Can you get that mic? Can you get that? The microphone, microphone, please. Thank you. That one be as much. Turn on the microphone, please. attraction. Okay, I can turn on. Uh, any radiation as a result of acceleration? Radiation, okay. So you want to know when you accelerate one of these charges, not only you get this field, but we do observe radiation. Uh, let's say, what is the Radiation from moving charge Okay, maybe uh, Toshi, maybe you have something you can add to our list of what if an, ex an electromagnet electrostatic field explanation should be able to do Okay, and uh, let's see here. Maybe Duncan. Duncan, do you have one that's not not listed here? I don't know if this question is uh, exactly on the point that you're getting at, but uh, in 1865, yes, 1865, Maxwell. Uh, published his paper, The Dynamical Theory of the Electromagnetic Field. How does your approach to the uh, electromagnetic field compare with uh, Maxwell's? Well, I suppose that would be a general question because it's not necessarily my, yeah. my theory. No, but that you, it could be, uh, how does this he compare? Was, he was using my in the general, general yeah. sense. How does this compare to Maxwell's theory. And are you talking about any particular year, 1861, 1865? I, I am talking about a particular year. Uh, eight, the, his 1861 paper is walked away from by Maxwell in 1865. It's in 1865 that his, uh, uh, his equations of electromagnetism and the idea that all uh, radiation is tied together. Uh, so you're talking about 1865 version, okay. 1865 version, that's right. Okay, I've read the 1861 version I haven't read the 1865 version. But I'll tell you, the 1861 version was just, I, I couldn't really understand it. It was just a model of math. And well, he, he was using vortices in the 1861 version. He mm -hmm. walks away from that in the 1865 version. 
It's the 1865 version that, that underlies uh, his uh, formulas, his equations that are still in use today. Okay. And I just, uh, your papers are on the, the subject of uh, electricity and magnetism and, uh, and the fields. And uh, he came up with a theory of electromagnetic fields in 1865 that supported his equations. How does your approach uh, compare with his? Uh, well, we're not in that stage right now. So all we're trying to do is that we're just trying to figure out what are some questions that anyone comes up with for electrostatic. So Bob, did you have another idea that we can add to our no, list? No, I wanted here? to clarify number two. It's number my two. understanding that each cloud is negatively charged. So the question really uh, asks how, how does lightning go between two clouds when they're both negative? Okay, although I'm not sure, like you said, that may not be a specific question specific to the electrostatic field, which is more about why an electron should it repel an electron versus a gross. I mean, when you start asking about that, you start asking about like how batteries work and how light bulbs work and how anything that uses electricity works. Um, but that would kind of be a different question, but I'll leave it there because maybe we'll, we'll get back to that. Uh, maybe David, David, you do you have any? David can't think and do chew gum at the same time. You can't chew. <laughs> I don't believe that. Okay. Yes, please. What about magnetic, oh, well, please. magnetic field? Please, microphone. Okay. Please. So Say perhaps the question is, what is the relationship oh. to magnetic fields? Would that be a good question? You should be able to at least explain what the relationship of a uh, magnetic field is, because we have these. The, the other weird thing is that you get these charges moving, then we observe this other thing called electromagnetic field, and perhaps that needs to be explained. So, um, how is it related to the magnetic field? Okay. So maybe we'll just start with that, okay. So we've got six possible things here and uh, we need to come up with some way of being able to motivate what these things are, right? Now, uh, I guess, uh, so Bob, you said that you, you had some idea that, would be, that may be able to explain these things. So you said that we have uh, the G1 particles, right? So let's, let's look at possible explanations here. So, so I think you said that there, there's G1 particles, and you said something about there being uh, more of these particles in one place than another. Yeah, in one cloud, you may uh, have microphone, more. Microphone, please. In one cloud, you'll have more G1s than in the other cloud. Okay, so let's take the basic the basic uh, case here. So you have two electrons, okay? So where would the G1s be? They are they the electrons. Are, they are the electrons. Here, let, for, for the discussion state, let's throw out G1 and call it electron, but it does not have charge, okay? Okay, well then you're starting out with still the problem that you have to explain why these two uh, fly away from each other. So, now it could be that you don't have an explanation for that. For a lot of uh, mainstream things, that's, that's, it's just fundamental that um, no, things the, do uh, that. The particular model we have does not, uh, without a charge, there is no repulsion. There is no charge. So, your G1 particles are neutral, and if you put two of them together, they'll do nothing. That's right. right. Okay. So. And that's perfectly fine. If you have a theory and and it doesn't explain things, then I think you should Wait just, a minute. Well, if it doesn't explain Wait why that happens, Okay, come on, guys. All fine. right, hold on. First of all, you're asking us to explain something that isn't in our model. We explain perfectly well all of these these things. So we got to be careful in the way we say this, because if you're asking us what happens to charged particles in our model, we can say nothing because we don't have charge. But it is not because the, the particle model that we're working on 
does in fact describe it. So we gotta be very careful because if we're in a public place and we're telling people about someone else's theory and says it doesn't describe it, we just have to be careful with that. Well, I'm still trying to figure out whether it does or not. No, 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 I'm not trying, I'm just saying, let's be careful about saying, uh, making conclusions about whether a person's model. I think what we can do is we can discuss obviously how it works, but let's try to refrain from saying, Duncan can't explain, his model can't explain this, or someone else, I just, well, that, I mean, could, that could, could be wrong. We're just trying to explain to you that two electrons, and as long as everybody in this room agrees that there are electrons, then we can observe the behavior that they fly apart. That's fundamentally what we need to explain. Okay, but in this model, I just want to clarify uh, that in our model, we do explain why the, uh, those would move apart. Okay, well, that's what I'm looking for. So why do they move apart? There's another gravitational field of small particles down one level. Okay, well, we can work with that. So we have, we have that thing and we have this thing and we have a, 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 a lower level, that's fine. So how does the lower level cause the, the observed reaction? Well, in this case, if uh, we have two particles like that, ours would attract because there's, in our model, what you put on the board is not a, a real, uh, is not in a, a field of any kind. So uh, it's, it's not, they would come together because if that's all that's on the board and we assume there's a G2 field there, they would come, come together. But what we would need to know is a bigger context of what, what those two particles are really in. Well, they're in the vacuum of space. Then, then in our model, that, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. So, you, I mean, models make predictions and your prediction would be if there's these two particles here, and that's the only thing that's in the world, then they wouldn't do anything. And that's fine. No, if there's nothing in the world, then they would just sit there. If there's nothing in the world. But in the real world, we observe these things fly apart. No, you don't. You observe those two things flying apart in a very specific... Uh, uh, if you give us the model where those things are in the world and tell us everything around it and give us a setup, we'll explain to why they go apart. Okay, I'll give you an exact setup. The setup is right here in this room. I have pith balls. I charge the pith ball up using my bandy graph generator to be net negative. I charge this one up net, net, net negative, and we observe that the two pith balls repel each other. Okay, so that's a very specific, real life, fully described situation. Okay. So, why do they do that? You want me to explain pith ball? Yeah, no, no. Yeah, you can explain the pith ball. I mean, that, that's fine if that's part. But this is the with, fundamental with uh, the, thing that we're trying to, like, to describe. First of all, there is no negative particle there in our model. So you know, the, that concept, that negative repels, is not the answer. Okay? I know that's what you want to hear, part. that negative repels, not the answer. What happens? is that when you have enough of those uh, particles, G1 particles in that left one, <coughs> and enough in the other one, then you have a second level gravity field around them, okay? And that uh, second level uh, uh, gravity field is going to uh, interact with the, G, the uh, particles in the two balls and start a flow of G1s, and the flow of... It's a Janu effect. Yeah, yeah, no, because, it, because it's got a truck, because it has the G1s, it has a flow around and through it that cre it creates a magnetic field around, because it's only a magnetic field that in our model that can repel. So there's a magnetic field around the, the, both of those, and they, they if, if the flow of the G1s through the, as a magnetic field around both those are in opposite directions, they will repel because <coughs> the particles in the magnetic field push against each other and separate. So you're saying it has something to do with magnetic field, so, so that thing, that pith ball generates that one, and then you're saying the magnetic field, something goes the other way, and uh, it's actually a magnetic effect. 
Yeah, and if it's a, uh, if those fields in the middle are opposing, they repel, that's because they're both, both of the, uh, the G1 flow through the uh, objects are, are going the same way. If, if you charge plus and minus, then the fields, one of the fields reverses, and, and therefore you don't have re re repulsion, or you'll have some minimal repulsion, but G2 gravity at the lower level will push them together. Ironically, even when they're repelling, there is a pushing going on, but the repulsion is stronger than the, uh, the pushing, and they repel. When it reverses, uh, there's very minimal repulsion, and G2 gravity pushes them together. That's how they attract. Okay, well, let's see how that, let's go through our list and see how, if we can answer some of these things here. So, with your theory, can you uh, tell us, you know, exactly what is the nature of the value of the, what we measure as the electrostatic fields, like it's like we could, we, uh, against these pith balls, like I can actually buy a meter, but I'm not really sure how they work. But they have a little probe, and uh, they have a little meter, and uh, as you get closer to this thing, it shows so a bigger value. Mean, obviously, with an electrostatic, with an electroscope is what you're talking about. You take an electroscope, it's got two, two, uh, two leads. Yeah, it's got two leads, that's one way of doing it, yes. It's got a, a, a marking on a, a, a grid of some sort, uh, calibrated or not, I don't know, but the, the closer you bring that to the, uh, to the balls, the, uh, the, they'll either collapse or separate. Yeah, so does, does your theory explain how that particular action works? I mean, that's a good description. Again, the, the two things in the electroscope can either, if they're gonna repel us because it's that same magnetic field that you pick up from the pith balls into the electroscope, induced into the electroscope, and if the, if the flow into the electroscope is in the same direction, in, in the one direction, okay, it creates a magnetic field around the two legs of the electroscope, which can either, which will repel, and, and if- So effectively, can, it, it just replicates the, the action of the pith balls. Okay, we can go with that. So uh, this was your, your, your question here. So does your theory, I don't know, explain this in any special way, which is cloud to cloud light? Well, yeah, because, I mean, you've got two, uh, two clouds being developed, right? And generally speaking, if I remember right, I hope that I got this right, that as the thermals, the water is up and down, it strips off the electrons, and so you get negative in this cloud and negative in that cloud, and yet you get cloud to cloud lightning. So okay. how does that work? Well, Again, you have two things like the pith ball, right? And, and what happens is that uh, there is a, a G2 gravity, a lower level gravity of particles coming around, which establishes the gravitational field between them. There's a gravity field between them, and, it, and the field depends on the how many are here and how many are here. But even if they're balanced, when, the, when they, there's many enough of these G1 particles or electrons in each cloud, you build up a differential just like gravity on one side and you build up a differential on the other side just like the Earth and the Moon being pushed together. And what happens is you start getting electrons or G1 particles getting pushed both ways. Lightning happens both ways. If you've ever read about it, you have leaders from the ground and leaders from the cloud when it's ground to ground lightning. In this case, you get- Closer to the microphone, please. Okay, and, and so incrementally, it, it's, it, when it gets to the point where they're gonna start moving those G1 particles, you to start getting these leaders between and when there's enough force, enough particles here and here, you get a strong enough force then they slam together, creating the lightning strike, where, and then the G1 particles, due to the heat generated, cause light to be emitted from the striking of the uh, particles together. Okay, well, there we go. And let's see here, so I think we already discussed the cause of the uh, acceleration tracks repulsion. That's basically a, a, like a magnetic kind of thing. 
And let's see here. Uh, Musa asked, what is the radiation from a moving charge? Uh, what is the radiation? From what is the radiation? Now, now if you, may, you may or may not have even gotten that, because I don't even think my theory has gotten into this. Lightning gives off uh, light. Is that radiation? Uh, that is a kind of radiation. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but that's what... You see, I mean, it's, not, it's not just a... The, the lightning, in this case, is a very strong uh, effect, and, that, and so you get the electro... what's generally called electromagnetic radiation. Uh, I have a question. Also, when you're talking about what is a tradition, what is the radiation from a moving charge, are you talking about one electron? Yeah, that's right. Yes. yes? Yeah, you're talking about one electron. One electron is, will not give, uh, in our model, will not give a uh, radiation. Okay, well that's fair enough. So so probably it says, it says it shouldn't happen. So For one electron. For one electron. If you have a situation where people are measuring that and something's going, if you have a situation... If you have a situation where someone is measuring it and they're claiming that it's one moving charge, and they can measure it, we can explain that. But it would, we would argue that, in fact, what they are measuring is a little different than what they say they are. Now, Duncan wants to know, how does this compare to Maxwell's theory? So I don't know if you've ever read Maxwell's theory. So. Uh, Maxwell is an electromagnetic, uh, both the wave light is both wave and, uh, I mean, electro, electric wave and magnetic wave. That's not our model for light. Uh, we have a different model. It doesn't match at all. Okay, so it's completely different. Okay. okay, so it doesn't explain Maxwell's theory. It suggests a different theory, which is perfectly fair. Maxwell could have been wrong, and you could have been right. So, no comparison. Okay. And so the final question here is, how is it related to the magnetic field? The okay. magnetic field is the, in a magnet, now I'm going to switch to a magnet, with the uh, magnetic field of G1s flowing around and through the magnet. Lower level gravity, G2, is perpendicular to that and controlling it. So the G2 gravity is the uh, perpendicular to it and it controls the magnetic, the flow around the magnet. In, this per in, that, in, in that sense, we agree with uh, the uh, electromagnetic wave being, the electric wave being perpendicular to the magnetic wave, but in this context, it's the, uh, the uh, G2 gravity that is controlling the magnetic flow, not, it, it's, it's really functionally different, but they are perpendicular. Okay, so, all right, well, thanks, thanks, Bob, and uh, Toshi, did you have a question? Um, you have to turn it on, there's a slide in the bottom. Push, push, it, up, push it up, push it up. When um, electro, electrostatic field, oh, let me see, the source of electrostatic field moves, does electrostatic field also move along with it, or it's separate? Yeah, I think that's kind of related to Luz's question, is that what is the radiation from a moving charge? So, I, I, I don't, Bob, do you have, is there, what happens? Well, 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 the electrostatic field between the two pith balls, uh, it, 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 you got these G2 particles that are moving very high speed. So the, the source of the field is moving fast through the, part, through the uh, pith balls. At any one point in time, there's a, uh, there's a, a, a change in the strength of those, those fields as, as it passes through the ball. And, and so there's a, uh, a strong force on the outside and uh, on both sides, and, and, a, and a graded force going down in between. Yeah, so the G, these particles are coming at are uniform and, uh, uh, and, and isotropic. That, that, that keep your, okay. You gotta keep the microphone closer, okay? Because we wanna hear you. Okay, okay. I got it. Gee. All right. Well, thank you, Bob, for volunteering to at least try to provide your, your theory of the electrostatic field and answering our six questions here. So, but of course, uh, 
Um, I, of course, have another way of explaining this, and that's in the proceedings. It's a one-page paper that tries to explain these things. So how tough could it be? If I could explain it in one page, how tough could it be? So, but I think that when we're talking about uh, the fundamental problem here, which is you have two charges here, and you want to know what causes these things to either come together or fly apart. And th there, are, there are some other theories here. So, I'll, I'll, for example, I will say that if there's any theory in the mainstream, one of them is that there's a, what's called an exchange particle. And uh, I once saw this in a Brian Green, you know, science special, where they had two people and they were throwing balls at each other and the faster they threw the ball, the more they would be attracted to each other. So that's one idea in the mainstream that, and actually the photon is the exchange particle of the uh, electrostatic field. So I suppose, I, I kind of lied a little bit by saying that the mainstream really doesn't have a really good idea, but if you're gonna pull an idea out of a hat, uh, that would be one of them. Um, another idea might be that that uh, typically the, the field that is, is shown around the particles is, is shown with like arrows. And so, so some people think that literally some fluid is coming out of the particle and your, your proton, your positron here does the opposite side, opposite thing and it sucks up all the, it sucks up all this fluid here. And uh, this is typically how electrostatic fields are depicted as, as these uh, vectors that go from one field to the other, right? So they do things like that, right? Of course, the only problem with that is that, is that uh, probably like if the proton was the thing that was sucking, you would think that you got two protons together that they would attract because they'd be all sucking. And if you had two electrons together and they're all spitting out this stuff, then you would think that would be all repelling. And if you had these two things together, that one's sucking, this one's uh, uh, spitting out, that that would really still result in no force because it's putting out as much as it can suck in. So these are difficult problems. All right. So I think we have to go back to, you know, what is a field to answer this question? What on earth do we mean by even that, right? So, like I said, anything that's a field apparently has some physical property uh, which can be measured any, any space and time, which I guess we're kind of going to um, this question of here, you know, what is the value of the electrostatic field at any point in time? And there's a difference between space, which has, I don't know, no electrostatic field compared to a really strong electric field, right? Now maybe there's no place in the world that has zero electric field, but there are definitely places like right next to a vanity graph generator where you can take this electrostatic meter and it, the reading is really high, right? So you've got to wonder what's causing that, but I think fundamentally what we call a field is just, you know, it, a designation is points that, and like other fields we have, we have like, you know, field of corn, right? We call those fields. And that's a field because it has it has something that's uniformly distributed through some kind of space, right? But now when we're talking about the electric field, you know, it has to have, at the very least, a vector direction, right? So you have a plus charge and a minus charge here. That determines a vector direction. And there's also magnitude, okay? So, Somehow, space has to physically represent that in a vacuum, right? So, is, is space totally empty, right? That is one possibility. Space equals empty. Nothing. So in a vacuum, nothing. So, but logically, can nothing represent the vector and the magnitude? And I would say, no. Uh, nothing can't have the basic property of measurability that we're looking for. So if space can't be empty, then what must it be? It must be what? Not 
Must be filled with something, right? Not empty. Well, what did you say, Ray? Not empty. Not empty, yeah, space. This is not empty. That's the, really the only other alternative, right? Space not empty. Okay. So if space is not empty. Partially. Or it could be partially empty. That's why I want to say. But it can't be completely empty. Okay. There must be something there. So the question is, what could that possibly be? Now, for uh, other other uh, scientists, uh, critical thinkers, you know, typically they, they would fill it with some particle. Uh, you know, uh, they could call it a fundamental ether particle or circulon or FP. It goes by many names, but typically some magical particle could be invented. You know, even in mainstream, they invent things like it could be those things called WIMPs, massively you know, mass particles interacting, something. It could be something out there, you know? What, what, what could it be, right? Or, you know, it might not be particles. It could be, I don't know, some uniform tension sheet. That's what people think. Could be, but it can't be nothing, right? So, but I, I prefer to think that it, it should be something that we know about, presumably. So, the, what, what do we know about? We know about neutrons, protons, electrons. We know about atoms. Uh, these are all the these are all the 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 uh, particles that we know about. So, you know, could it be electron? I think that's what uh, that's what one of our famous scientists said that there's going to be a sea of electrons, right? But uh, that that would be highly negatively charged, and I think that that would tear apart everything in the universe. So that doesn't seem to be the, the greatest idea. Uh, it could be positron, but that would kind of have the same problem. Uh, it could be, I don't know, hydrogen atoms, right? We could fill the entire universe with hydrogen atoms, right? And it would have the correct property that it could represent a vector because it has a positive and a negative charge. So depending on which way you aim it, that would be a vector. And uh, I suppose the more of them that you have, then, well, I don't know. I don't know if that could represent a magnitude, but it could represent a vector, perhaps. But if, if all the space was filled with hydrogen, I'm pretty sure we would have detected that too. So that's not really going to work either. So can't fill space with atoms. Can't fill it with electrons or positrons. Could fill it with protons, but then we'd have the same problem we did with electrons. Uh, so there is one prop. There was one. There is one particle left. That's neutron. Okay. Well, there's a possible particle we could fill all space with. Neutrons are really, really hard to detect. They're neutrally charged, and uh, the experiments do say that this thing does have embedded in it a positive and negative charge somehow. So that could represent the directional vector that we need in space, just physically. So I can point somewhere, right? But none of this explains why why um, why two electrons can attract each other, right? Electrons, electrons, electrons filled with neutrons everywhere, and it's like they should do nothing, really. I don't think. But we do have a basically a gaseous medium to work with here, okay? So we have a gaseous medium neutrons that we can work with. So how can we possibly get the electron to run away from each other? So I think you know Duncan was talking about anytime you really see that, it's because there's uh, basically higher pressure between the particles than on the outside. So you know the, the the analogy is the vacuum cleaner, and so whenever you see two things come together. It's really because the pressure has been reduced between these things, and it's causing them to, because the pressure on the outside is greater, it's causing them to push together. You know, same thing on a billiard ball table. If you see two balls coming together, really the only reason that could ever happen is if two other balls hit those two balls on the outside and pushes them together. And by Newtonian physics, really there, there are no real attractive forces. They are all that's all just collisional forces, A pushing B. So this is where I think we should, we should uh, put our attention here, is find out some mechanism where we can create a lower pressure between 
uh, well, actually higher pressure between electrons. We want to, between an electron and a proton, we want to create a lower pressure. And between two positrons, we want to create, once again, that higher pressure, right? So how do we, how do, we do that with objects which are, as far as we can see, completely identical? Same mass, same everything, right? But if we put, you know, two, two positive things here, they repel, a positive and a negative, they attract. Okay? Now, that is very difficult to achieve, okay? For like the, the same problems I showed about if you have an outflowing ether particle versus the inflowing, it just doesn't work out, okay? And uh, the only solution I have seen, and this was not my solution, is to think of something like a wave emanating from these particles. Okay, so you've established that there may be a, a medium, just like air, and if you can think that there's waves that come off of these particles, then the waves can interact and create, say, a region of high pressure and low pressure. So the, the, the concept is very easy that the electron you know, emits a wave and the other electron emits a wave. They're at the same frequency, so between the two electrons, they add up and they create this region of high pressure. So that's just the basic mechanism. Now between a proton and electron, uh, these have both are sending waves, but these are sending it in opposite phases. Therefore, when between the two particles, they cancel. And that creates an, a region of lower pressure, not zero pressure, but it's higher than all the pressure that's coming on the outside here. So this is one, I thought this was a clever way to get the, 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 the observation that the similar charges, no matter what they are, repel, but any kind of opposite charges uh, attract. That, that's just due to the phase cancellation here, right? So that is, that is the very, very basic idea that I'm trying to put forth in order to explain you know, what that electric field is. So, in the last five minutes, we're gonna go over whether this answers these particular questions. So. So the question is, what is the value of the electrostatic field at any point? Well, I am saying that the electron here is generating a wave, okay? So, and this is an ordinary, this would be an ordinary electromagnetic wave, like light. So it would be essentially the same equivalent as like saying, you know, what is the, what is the uh, strength of the light coming from the light bulb? At any point in this room, you could measure how strong the light was being emitted from that light bulb. And so to answer this question, the electrostatic field, is that you just be measuring the strength of that electromagnetic field emanating from that point. Or if you had a pith ball, uh, you would actually be measuring the strength of the electromagnetic field. So that's how to do that. So number two, what causes cloud to cloud lightning? Well, I don't think, like I said, this has particularly relevant to the mechanics, although I would say that if, if you look at how clouds form, they, they do charge separation. Basically, all of the negative charges tend to migrate to the bottom. All the positive charges tend to migrate to the top. So it's not terribly surprising that you might see a discharge between the negative part of one cloud and the positive part of the other. And so, but that's how I, I that's how I would explain cloud lightning. Just as do the charge separation is not it's a fully mechanical thing. It doesn't really have anything to do with the electrostatic field itself. Okay, so number three, what causes the acceleration, attraction, repulsion? So that's what I've been motivating with the phased interactions here. Number four, what is the radiation from a moving charge? Well, in this case the radiation can be specifically seen as these waves being emanated from the particle. And if you move the particle, then it would be just like uh, what you would see in a wave tank, where if you had a moving particle and you moved it, you would see it would, it would leave a wake, and it would still emanate the waves. And if you went faster than the, the wave propagation speed, then you might get something like a sonic boom. But generally, you can consider this just as the same as the hydrodynamic case. 
because it's just a way emanating from a particle. <coughs> so, uh, so how does this compare to Maxwell's theory 1865? Okay, well I did read Maxwell's theory 1865, although I heard what, what Duncan was saying about it and all the things that he was saying about, uh, I, I, would, I would totally agree with things like uh, there, there must be there must be something in space, right? And uh, so what are the things that, that, the main points about the ether that, that uh, you were saying that Maxwell was making? Because I think I agree with almost all of them. Uh, the answer to your question is not uh, one that can be given in a single sentence or two sentences. In the paper I've submitted, which is in the proceedings, uh, of this conference, uh, I spell out uh, step by step what Maxwell developed in a physical sense to support his electromagnetic uh, equations. Uh, they're there. It would take a long time for me to go through them. I, I, it would take quite a long time to go through them. I went through them step by step when I presented my paper to this conference. They're there uh, and uh, it, it, he goes into detail how ether forms a medium and mechanically what that ether does. And that supported his equations which are still used today. I do not see how one can come up with a, a theory or concept of uh, an electromagnetic field without dealing with what Maxwell developed in 1865. It fell into disuse with the advent of the Michelson-Morley experiments and uh, the special theory of uh, Einstein, particularly his concept of quanta, or now known as photons, and with the development of the, uh, the quantum mechanics theory in the 1920s. That's all dealt with in my paper. But with the great, great respect, Franklin, I do not see how anybody can come up with a theory of the electromagnetic field without first dealing with what Maxwell developed in 1865. Well, like I said, I, I listened to your theory, I mean, your, your speech, and what you were describing, and uh, I didn't hear anything about Maxwell's vort vortices C, which was the 1861 part paper, which I completely disagree with, but all the things that he said about the ether, I think were absolutely correct. Although I'm not sure that Maxwell himself motivated exactly why positrons and electrons might attract each other even. So, but everything he was saying about the, uh, the ether, I think, was correct. And so finally, the final question is, how is this related to the magnetic field? Well, I guess that's a segue into my next talk here, because I'm out of time for this talk. And, uh, and that's what I will explain next in my next speech. With what is the relationship of the magnetic field to the electric field? All right, so I think that will do it for, for this part of the thing.